Also, we notice that potentials arise spontaneously. And that's due to the mobility of, of charges. Charges in conductors. Uh, remember, we talked about metals having a, a Fermi level, where they have a preferred energy level for the electrons in the system. And so if we have different metals, they will have different Fermi levels. But if we put them in contact with each other, because there is a, an electrical conduction between the two metals, the electrons will equalize to form a equal Fermi levels on each, in each case. So electrons will be transferred back and forth. And for example, uh, zinc having a little higher Fermi level than copper, it turns out that there'll be a, a net uh, transference of electrons from zinc to copper, and it turns out that we'll get a interfacial potential across that zinc-copper interface. So anytime we have a metal, say, with a interface with a semiconductor, uh, say, say, for example, platinum silicon or metal solution, uh, there will be a potential differences associated with that. Even on insulators in solution, there will be actually an interfacial potential built up. Now, the insulators are fundamentally different because we don't have a the mobility of the charges, but there will still be a surface potential at that insulator solution interface. Also, interestingly enough, there will be a potential difference uh, between solutions and solutions. So if we have two different solutions in contact with each other, now in this case we have to ver make sure that the solutions are not allowed to mix together. But for example, suppose we have a um, solution of say one molar HCl and a solution of 0.01 molar HCl separated by some sort of porous barrier. Well, because the diffusion will go from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, the hydrogen ions will diffuse across that barrier from the high concentration of, uh, of um, hydrogen ions. And the chloride ions will also diffuse across that barrier to the, to the uh, lower concentration of chloride ions on that side. The, di the difference is, is that the chloride ions actually don't diffuse as rapidly as the hydrogen ions. So what happens is that there is now a potential asymmetry built up where we have left over. Some of the chloride ions are left behind while the hydrogen ions race ahead. And so that suggests that there will be a net uh, potential buildup at that interface. In fact, that's what we see. We get a positive uh, potential at the lower concentration of HCl compared to the um, solution that has the higher concentration of HCl. And that's not an insignificant potential. It can be a few tens of millivolts. It's called a liquid junction potential. Okay, so all of these potential potentials that arise in the interface are important. In fact, they're exploited in many cases for physical or sensor measurements. Pla uh, metal metal uh, uh, potential differences are exploited for, say, uh, thermocouples. That the magnitude of the potential difference changes with temperature in thermocouples. Uh, platinum si silicons are also, platinum semiconductor uh, electrodes are also exploited for that similar reason. Okay. So anytime we've got an interface at the potential, or interfa a set of interfaces, there will be some unknown potential difference across all those interfaces. Now in principle, we could calculate all those potential differences for any given chemical system and come up with a, an exact uh, potential 
across the, a theoretical potential across all of those. For example, let's go back to our cell again. We've got our cell of copper and copper wire on the other side. And we're trying to measure the difference between the copper phase on one side and the copper phase on the other side. And um, we can do that. But that difference in the potentials is due to all the potential differences at all the interfaces. And so we can kind of diagrammatically indicate that by the following, where the potential is on one, the y-axis, and the x-direction would indicate sort of the direction along this cell. And we can think, well, we've got uh, um, copper has a particular potential, and then there's going to be an interfacial potential between the copper and the zinc. And then there's going to be an interfacial potential between the copper and the zinc, two plus ions in solution. And then there's going to be an interfacial potential between the um, uh, actually, let me insert. There it actually turns out to be a we have to put silver silver chloride and um, AG. In other words, the silver chloride is in the solution phase and the silver is in the, in a, a separate phase, but sorry about that. And so then there might be another potential difference between the solution and another potential difference between, say, the silver and the copper prime. And so what's the uh, potential difference across the interface? Well, it would just be, this would be the potential difference that we would measure. right here, and that would be this case. Now the solution has zinc 2 plus, has chloride ions, and it has silver chloride in it. So it kind of seems like an impossible situation. If we want to understand the interfacial potentials of a given interface, and then what's the interface would that be? Well, that would be the you know, in this case, we probably are interested in the interfacial potential between the zinc electrode and the zinc in solution. So that means we've got a kind of a problem. We have to understand all these other potentials, interfa interfacial potentials, to understand that potential from the zinc metal and the zinc in solution. Well, the saving grace for us is that we can actually usually arrange our experiment so that we can modify one interface and maintain it, uh, maintain the other interfaces at the same potential. So in other words, suppose we're interested in the zinc 2 plus and zinc interface. Well, if we're interested in what happens when, say, when we add more zinc to the system, zinc 2 plus to the system, make it a higher concentration or a lower concentration, we can maintain the interfacial potentials of all the other uh, interfaces nearly constant. And then if we make that assumption that the other interfacial potentials do not shift, then we can actually understand what happens at one interface in a relative way with respect to the other interfaces. So that's the basic scheme for almost all of the electrochemical measurements that try to understand what's happening at one particular interface. Change only that one interfacial process and then hope that the other potentials of the other interfaces do not shift. And so that is, for example, okay if as long as we don't change the temperature too much or we don't change the concentration of the silver chloride in that solution and, uh, for, and that sort of thing. And those are often the case. We can, we can do that. 
Okay, well, let's stop here for our break and uh, we'll uh, continue in about uh, five, ten minutes. As I was just mentioning at, at, as we left, the, we're trying to keep one solution interface constant while varying the rest. So as we, our goal and our, our methodology will be to study potentials at interface, we try to keep one potential interface as constant, all the other interfaces as constant as possible and, and vary the one. Um, one other thing we should mention at that point, at this point, is that the nature of a potential, really the surface charge at the interface, as we, if we think about a metal, the amount of charge on a metal, interf uh, metal electrode or uh, a conductor like a carbon electrode is quite um, invariant because, the, because of what happens is that um, the charge really can't change. There's about 10 to the 22nd atoms per uh, cubic centimeter, or, or I'm sorry, electrons per cubic centimeter in a, uh, in a metal. So a little bit of charge leaking off or on of that metal surface really doesn't make any difference. Yeah, it, it, they're the same though. So there we go. Yeah, about one depends on how many electrons per atom. But so so it doesn't really matter if we lose uh, thirty thousand electrons off of our metal. It's not going to change the uh, amount of charge that we've got available in our in our metal. So pretty much all of the charge is localized at the surface. That changes though when we talk about materials that have lower charges or low, lower density of charges in the material. For example, a semiconductor has much lower number of electrons per cubic centimeter orders of magnitude lower numbers of things. And so the charge at the surface has a distribution. And if you've done any work with semiconductors, you might recognize the word they use for it. They call that distribution of charge a space charge. So rather than having the charge fixed at a very thin film on a metal conductor, we have this charge distributed over a wide region of the interface, relatively wide. And that space charge region in a semiconductor is about 5 to 200 nanometers thick. The reason we have a space charge there is because the Boltzmann distribution predicts a, a distribution of thing, uh, charges at the interface. Uh, at a metal, there are so many charges that the, distribu the Boltzmann distribution would predict a very thin layer, but with, as we have less and less charges to move around, the Boltzmann distribution widens out. And so we have a, a larger distribution of charges. The same thing exactly happens for a solution interface. And these all will show up again. I'm just kind of introducing you to the concept here. Uh, I'll say on a solution interface, same thing happens. We have a fixed number of ions in the solution, a quite a small number of ions, in fact. And so if we have a metal electrode with this thin, thin layer of charge, we're going to have ions around that metal, but they will be distributed in space. Again, we'll have a space charge uh, distribution in the system. In fact, because electrochemistry and semiconductors come from different fields, they call that a different thing. They call this the diffuse layer. But in fact, it's the same exactly concept than in practice. So we can make a general statement. The higher the number of charge carriers, the thinner the space charge. So a diffuse layer in electrochemistry may extend out, say, 200 nanometers with a very dilute solution of electrolytes, say a few millimolar concentration of potassium chloride, to, a, to a 5 nanometers or so for, say, a 1 molar or a saturated 
potassium chloride solution. So one way to reduce the space charge effects is to make the concentration of charge carriers higher. Okay. 